Last year, I released a video giving you five tips on how you can improve your automotive filmmaking. Now, you guys definitely showed me that you enjoyed that video and you liked it. So I'm back giving you five more tips on how you can take your automotive filmmaking to the next level. But before we jump into this video, if you're new to the channel, my name is Joe and I run a video production company by the name of Driven Films, where I specialize primarily in filming for the automotive industry. On this channel, I bring you honest and unbiased reviews of camera gear that I use out in the field, as well as breakdowns of projects and tips and tricks that will help you improve your work. Now, if that's something you're interested in, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Now, the first tip, I feel is a no brainer, but I feel it needs to be said outright. And that's that you need to focus on the safety of yourself, your crew and your client. When filming out on the road, one way to keep things safe is to use a car rig instead of hanging out the back of a car. Yeah, sometimes it may look cool for Instagram if you're hanging out the side of a window, but that is absolutely 100% unprofessional and unsafe. A few different car rigs that you can use that are fairly affordable are the Rig Wheels Cloud Mount, as well as the Tilta Hydra system. Now I had been using the Rig Wheels Cloud Mount for about three years, and it definitely served me well, and it is an absolute bargain when it comes to car rigs, and it allows you to mount your rig on the side of a vehicle, on the hood, on the back, all different types of configurations, and it's extremely easy to set up, and plus it's very safe for your vehicle as well as yourself. Now, I understand that in the event you don't have the budget for that, and you may have to just use a gimbal by sitting in the back of a pickup truck or at the back of an SUV or on the side door of a minivan, so what you can do for that is you can get a safety harness, usually a roofer's safety harness or a rock climbing harness. You can get those at your local Home Depot or hardware store, or if you are looking for a rock climbing harness, you could probably find those online. That would definitely help keep yourself safe and secure because in the end, if you fall out of a vehicle while you're filming, there's a very good chance you're going to get hurt. So take it from me, be safe when you're filming, especially when filming car to car. Now this next tip is absolutely going to be a game changer for some of you. And if you are shooting outdoors during a sunny day, chances are you're going to have an overexposed image. Now you have two ways to combat that overexposure. First, you could stop your lens down, basically raise your aperture up to F22 and sacrifice any or all depth of field. Alternatively, you could add what's called an ND filter. Now what an ND filter, also known as a neutral density filter does, is that it reduces the amount of light that is coming into the lens and ultimately hitting the sensor. ND filters come in all shapes and sizes, including circular filters that screw onto the lens, as well as rectangular or square filters that fit into a matte box or filter holder. When filming with a bigger camera package, I prefer to use a 4x5.65 ND filter from Firecrest in a matte box such as the Bright Tangerine Misfit Atom. And when filming with a car rig, I do add a clear protective filter like this one from Nisi in front of the ND to protect the expensive ND filters and ultimately the lens if a rock does happen to fly up and chip the filter. So if you're using a clear filter, luckily it's a cheap filter, it's 20 bucks, your lens or your ND is not going to get damaged. Now there are a few different types of ND filters like I mentioned. First, you have a single stop filter. So an ND filter that will reduce the amount of light by X amount of stops. So for instance, one filter could stop or reduce the amount of light by six stops, some by eight stops. But then there are also filters called variable ND filters. And what these filters allow you to do is to turn the filter or adjust it to reduce the amount of light by X amount of stops. So this one filter could reduce the stops by two, four, six, or eight, all in one filter. Now, this does help to keep things more simple. You have one filter on the lens that you use for various different lighting situations. This gives you many more creative options when you are setting up your shot. So you're not gonna have any more overexposed images. You're gonna have a nice, cleanly exposed shot, no matter what the lighting conditions. Now, there's a good chance you've noticed that cars are basically gigantic mirrors. 
whether it's another car, objects in the foregrounds, or even yourself as you film the car, you want to be able to remove or reduce those reflections. And that's where a CPL, also known as a circular polarizer filter, comes in. By simply placing the filter on your lens and rotating it, you are now adjusting the reflections in not only the car, but also water and other reflective surfaces. It will also darken the sky depending on how you turn it. Now, there are various different CPL filters out there, like this one from Breakthrough Photography or this one from Tiffin here, but there may be some instances where you want to combine ND, neutral density, with a CPL polarizer. What you could do is get a combo filter like this NDPL filter from Polar Pro or this one from KNF. Now, this filter from KNF is actually a variable ND and CPL filter. What this means is you could adjust the circular polarizer as well as the variable ND. Now I use both of these options when I wanna keep things lightweight. I just need one single filter. I don't need a stack. I don't need to worry about you know, any sort of glare or color shift. I know that I've got one filter that handles everything. So if you are looking to reduce or change or modify the reflections on this gigantic mirror that we call a car, you can use a CPL filter or an NDPL filter. Now, this is one of the most common mistakes that I see beginners make. And this isn't just related to shooting cars. This will carry over to any sort of work you do, whether it's fashion, fitness, music videos, whatever it is, corporate work, this is going to make your work look much more professional and that's editing at the right frame rate. Now, when you're shooting, of course, you could shoot at higher frame rates like 60 FPS, 120 FPS if your camera allows it, and this will allow you to capture slow motion footage. It's when you edit that you have to pay very close attention to what your timeline's frame rate is set to. Now, this may be a little bit confusing to some. You may think that just because you shot at 60 frames per second that you need to edit at 60 frames per second, and that is absolutely not the case. When you are editing, especially if you're in the US, you want to use a timeline set to 24 frames per second. You could do 30 frames per second, but 24p does look a little bit more cinematic, a little bit more filmic, and much more natural. So essentially what this does is you've set your timeline frame rate, 24p, 30p if you'd like, and now you could bring in your footage, whether it's 60p, 120p, 50p, whatever it is, that is your slow motion footage. You've now brought that into your timeline and you could bring it in and slow it down if you'd like. Now there are various ways to slow down the footage and we're not going to go over that, but you could either change the speed of the clip or you can interpolate it. I'm gonna put a link in the description to a video that does explain how to do this properly. So this way, if you guys want to see how to properly interpolate your slow motion footage, onto a 24p timeline, you could do it, links down in the description. Now, my personal opinion is that when I am shooting car to car footage or rollers, as many call it, I do shoot that at 24 frames per second because this gives me a much more natural look to my footage. If I do know that I'm going to do like maybe a speed ramp or some sort of slow motion, I do change the frame rate to 60p or 120p depending on what camera I'm filming on. But overall, I try to stick to 24p since again, this gives me the most natural looking motion possible. Now, on the other hand, if you are filming B-roll, say you're at a car show and you're filming some shots of the engine, some shots of the interior, which I hope you're doing because I mentioned it in the last video, it is absolutely okay to slow your footage down to 60p or whatever it is, just to get that nice, smooth, slow motion look. And once you bring it into post, you can slow it down and you've got some really nice, smooth, steady B-roll. Now, speaking of natural looking movement, we are shooting a moving object. So you want to adhere to the 180 degree shutter rule. Most cinema cameras have the option to change your camera's shutter speed to shutter angle. This allows you to set your shutter speed to 180 degrees like the rule is. So anytime you change your frame rate, it automatically adjusts your shutter speed. Now, the easiest way for me to explain the 180 degree shutter rule is that whatever frame rate you are filming at, you want to take your shutter speed and double it. So if you're filming at 60p, 60 frames per second, you want to shoot at the closest shutter speed that is double your frame rate. So 60p would be 1 125th, 24p would be 150th. 
This will give you the most realistic looking motion blur and movement in your shot. If you were shooting at a lower shutter speed or a higher shutter speed, you may get something that looks very jarring or just not realistic. Now, if you are interested in learning more about the 180 degree shutter rule, I've put a link down in the description below to Gerald Undone's video on the topic. So if you guys wanna learn more about it, go check that out. Now, here's one final bonus tip for you guys, and that's to make use of sound design in your videos. This goes for any video you're doing, whether automotive, fitness, fashion, sports, whatever it is, you want to make use of good sound design. Now, if you wanna learn more about how to perform sound design, how to do it and how to make your videos just stand out, I put a link down in the description below to a video I did on how to do sound design for a car commercial. So if you're interested, go check that out. But we're gonna dive into it just a little bit and I'm gonna explain how you can utilize sound design to improve your videos. Now, before I start editing, and sometimes before I even start shooting, I like to choose the music that I'm going to use for the project. Now, while you can find free music out there, chances are that it's copywritten music. So especially if you're uploading to social media like YouTube, you want to make sure that your music is what's called royalty-free music. What this means is that you are not going to get hit with a copyright claim if you upload your video to YouTube, Vimeo, Instagram, or wherever it may be. For this, I use Artlist.io because it's all royalty-free music that I pay a subscription for, and I have access to thousands and thousands of amazing songs that I can use in my videos. Now, not only does Artlist have music, but you can also access various different sound effects. So for example, in this after movie that I produced for the Sebring 24 hour race, I've chosen my music bed, I finished my edit, and I've got all of the engine sounds that I've recorded, whether it's in camera or externally, and I've overlaid all that into my video. And once I've done that, I begin adding sound effects like whooshes, bass drops, hits, and risers. And once I've added those effects in to accentuate the video, I start by adding Foley sound effects. Now what Foley sound effects are is they're effects that recreate everyday sounds. Now in this after movie, I used various different Foley effects from Artlist.io that would be almost impossible for me to capture in camera. Now, for example, in this shot here, I used a gravel sound effect to give the shot of the Audi going off track a little bit of added emphasis and to make it a bit more exciting for the viewer. So just this little gravel sound effect added underneath the car audio and underneath the music helps to bring a little bit more life to the project and a little bit more excitement to the shot. So if you are looking to spice up your edits by using high quality music, that is royalty free, as well as sound effects to help your sound design, you can sign up for a yearly plan at artlist.io by clicking the link in the description. So that wraps it up, guys. I hope you use these tips in your work to create something you're proud of. And if you'd like to share what you've created with the Driven Films Discord community, I invite you guys to join. You'll find a link down to the Discord in the description below. Now, if you find these tips useful and you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and share it on social media. And of course, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Until next time, take care.